Hello, hello, hello. So there's a, a few changes with this episode. So for a start, you'll notice that we're we're not in the usual setting. It's a new setting, ye old ye old Athens. And uh just out here you can see uh the, the good old Acropolis. So uh yeah, you can see that's the the Erechtheon up there. You can see a little bit of the Parthenon. I don't know how clear that is, but uh the the main thing you can see there is the Erechtheon, which is a, a temple of Athena and Poseidon. So apparently it goes back to some ancient myth about uh Athena and Poseidon fighting for who was going to to kind of be the, the patron god of, of Athens. And apparently you can even see Poseidon's trident marks up on the up on the temple. I I did not notice it the last time I was up there, but you know, it's they might be there. And that's something that I find quite interesting because of Athens being like the this you know the the Athenian Empire being this great naval empire and and kind of controlling the Aegean after pushing the the Persians back and then on the other hand you've got Athena you got like the birthplace of philosophy sort of like in later Athenian history there is this interesting kind of uh, tension between those two forces so cool to see a, a temple up there on the Acropolis to that and yeah the other new thing we've got going on is a, a new camera so the the setup is a bit different it's a bit weird it's probably going to take some some getting used to so yeah let me know what you think of all that now to talk about what was really one of the big episodes on the channel ken wilbur's four quadrants and this took this it's kind of wrecked my head a little bit trying to put it together because there's so much so much information that wilbur this is basically sex ecology spirituality is these four quadrants just him exploring this in depth and so to try and boil down all of this into a form that was useful I had, I had to leave out so much of of his theory and just really kind of pair it back to to what I found the most useful and really mapping it over for what we're using on the channel so yeah it was really the the writing of it and boiling that down and then the the editing and it was 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 something else so uh yeah but it looks like the work kind of kind of has has paid off I uh I was actually thinking you know, I was saying to a friend before I, I put up the video, I was just like, yeah, this is only going to be, this is going to be like Thomas Kuhn. It's like really obscure idea. It's probably going to be like struggle to get to 1000 views, but <laughs> just shows I really don't know what's, I really don't have a good gauge of, of, of these things. So yeah, i delighted with how it's worked out. Great feedback, like a lot of interaction. So it's been really cool. It's been really uh, fulfilling. So it wasn't just uh, me learning a lot of editing stuff and me boiling down a lot of stuff for myself. It's it's actually uh, been one of the the bigger videos on the channel, which is which is quite fun. So yeah, I guess the point of this video is to talk about why this episode matters, why what's important about it for me, and and what why why I've chosen this topic and what I'm building towards and. That's probably a lot more obvious with this with this video than with a lot of other videos because you can see that it's a map that is that stitches together so much of what we've been talking about on the channel and I think it's a really good one to put a flag in to so that we're coming going to come back and we're going to refer to this again and again I I, I think and uh, just make it part of the language but it's definitely something to keep in mind as we're layering the different schools of thought and different thinkers into it is, is to kind of conceptualize have a good idea of what they're what part of the map they're trying to work with so it was really interesting for me in making the episode to try and map over all these thinkers that I've been working with that Wilbur doesn't necessarily talk about and to see where they, where they fit in together. So that's, that's been, that was really fun. And it's actually been really interesting to see how much continental philosophy is really focused in on quadrant three and the, the quadrant of the, the collective internal. And yeah, that's, I, I, I guess I intuited it, but I, I, I hadn't actually realized how much it really digs down in that. I guess phenomenology and existentialism will be more Q1. Q1 has always been like more my soft spot. And it's, I guess, that work of personal development, all that studying of psychology and uh, running all these experiments on myself and really trying to live that best life has all been kind of very much Q1 work and kind of bringing Q2 into that by looking at the the actual field of psychology and looking at what's come out of neuroscience and stuff and trying to apply that in in moving forward in Q1. But I just over the years, and even looking back now, the, the thing with Q3, I can see why it's fascinated me so much, even going back to like, this is really where Nietzsche is doing most of his work and what's really exciting about Nietzsche. And for me, this is the the torch gets passed from Nietzsche to Jung. And I can see the same torch getting passed from Nietzsche to Foucault and 
So you have Nietzsche's work on things like the Dionysian and the Apollonian, and then his distinction between master morality and slave morality. Like these are really classic Q3 kind of ideas. And then if you look at Jung, well, like Jung's work, and what's interesting is that Wilbur would say that Jung was just a Q1 thinker. But for me, it's it's actually much more than that because he he picks up that that kind of Q3 torch that Nietzsche holds and he brings into this realm of the collective unconscious and the archetypes. And the archetypes aren't simply personal forces. It's not just your personal psychology in the way that the Stoics are dealing with or in the way that the Balterian ideal of cultivating your own garden. It's Jung is really... He's talking about these impersonal collective forces and that really one of my favorite parts of Jung or my favorite insights that really has made me think a lot was he was saying between the two world wars he noticed the the blonde beast awakening in the German psyche and he associated with the energy of the the, the Norse god Wotan and that's something we've explored a little bit previously on the channel and that's that's very much a, a Q3 idea to see this this something collective force that is that is moving us that is driving the culture forward and something that we're quite unconscious of. So I think that young, this idea of the archetypes and the collective unconscious is very much a Q3 idea. Even if Young's work around individuation and kind of at, attaining the the perfection of the self is the perfection of the ego, is that Q1 kind of work, I still think it's actually, it bleeds into this greater thing, especially with synchronicity and, and these other big, big ideas in Jung. This is, he's really jumping off into this collective internal sphere. And that Nietzsche quote from the episode about the majority of the thinking of philosophers being guided into certain canals by by the instincts really maps over well with this idea in Jung because he uses the word instinct and an archetype almost synonymously. So it's, it's really this kind of collective force that they're both tapping into, which is something that I find really important. And looking at the, the, the stuff we've been looking at over the last year in terms of like continental philosophy, you get a, a completely different angle on that to what I think you see in, in Nietzsche and in Jung, which is more looking at structuralism, trying to unearth the, the structures, trying to unearth the long, the, as with semiotics as well, un- trying to unearth that long, or trying to unearth that underlying structure and seeing that they're coming at it from a, a very different point of view. And I think in future, when we're looking at analytic philosophy and diving more into Wittgenstein, we're going to see more at like yet another angle and even more technical. So it's interesting to start piecing together this Q3 mystery. And I, I realize I'm becoming more and more fascinated by this Q3 quadrant. And I'm working through this book by Foucault at the moment. It's a collection of his writings and his teachings on power, which is proven to be really fascinating. There's something very liberating about these these Q3 thinkers and, and the because the thing is that we're so entrenched in a certain way of being in a certain cultural ocean that it's very hard to see outside of that. And that's what I find interesting studying things like traditionalism, modernity, post-modernity, meta-modernity is to try and get an insight into into these different perspectives of seeing the world and these different oceans that we're we're swimming in. And what I find interesting with Foucault is he's picking up where Nietzsche left off with genealogies and we're trying to unearth the the structure of truth and, and where this idea of truth kind of came from and how it's it's come to take form and how we've arrived at where we are. And this is something that Kuhn works on as well in the structure of scientific revolutions where we realize that science is actually a very much a, a culturally conditioned kind of thing and that there's a there's a cultural ocean that scientists are swimming in rather than this permanent un unchanging eternal kind of truth it's it's a cultural a collective cultural experience that they're swimming in so yeah I just I realized that I've been very much on this buzz for a few months and it's kind of been good to to make this episode and to dig into this map and to realize where I'm at and and how all of this really fits in with what I've been thinking about and I've been thinking as well like this it's it brought up this thought that's been rattling around in my head for a few years which is that Humanity, like we've, we've, we've attained a very high level of consciousness at the individual level, but we are still completely unconscious as a herd, as a collective. And it's, and I should clarify there that when I say individual consciousness, I don't mean to say that there's this given high level of consciousness in every single human now. And while to a degree, I do think that the general level of consciousness has, has risen an incredible amount. 
there's it's there's much further reaches of consciousness we can attain because there's these maps, whether it's coming from neuroscience, from spiritual traditions, from ancient philosophical schools to psychotherapy. There's all these different way markers and a million and one steps you can take towards broadening your consciousness. But then you look at the collective, you look at the herd of humanity and we're still pretty much entirely unconscious. We have certain maps like the, the map between traditionalism, modernity, post-modernity, meta-modernity, or the works of people like the Jungian Eric von Neumann, or you have Spiral Dynamics, or even just Jung's work in general. But really, there's just so few maps to understanding like collective consciousness and to raising the level of collective consciousness. And it, it almost, it, it seems weird to talk about it. Like it almost doesn't make sense to think about being conscious as a collective and Yet, if you think back to it and you go back maybe 50,000 years, and so I'm thinking of Eric von Neumann's work, The Origins and History of Consciousness here, and in that he talks about how consciousness, so he looks at the ancient mythologies and he looks at the, the stories around the, the emergence of consciousness and how slow and how painful and how we were all just dissolved in the herd, we were all just dissolved in this in this state of being, and, and then out of that slowly those consciousness won this very, very hard one ground to try and get individual consciousness to take root. And that's something that has grown more and more, especially in the last few hundred years of this, this idea of individualism and, and having more and more of your own mind to yourself rather than being subsumed within the, the collective. So it's like we need to individuate as individuals and then we can think about individuating as, as a collective and maybe gaining some consciousness as a collective. And so I've been thinking a lot about what it means for us to be conscious as a, as a collective and whether that is an idea that makes any sense. And I guess the, the, the obvious evidence that we are not conscious as a collective is if you look at something like climate change or in a previous episode, we explored the, the bacterial curve as a, as a better analogy for, for human development rather than the cancer idea. And you can just see that there's an unconscious trend. There's a, there's an instinctual trend that we're just playing out. There's no real consciousness involved. Like we can have individual consciousness and we could talk about cultivating our own garden and improving our own world. But it seems that when it comes to the the, the collective and how we move as a herd, as a murmuration, it, it, there's just very limited consciousness. We know the climate change is coming, but the, the problem is so complex and how you maneuver that many layers of psychology and all these vested interests that are playing against each other and this collective field of humanity. And it just seems like... We, we know we're coming to a cliff. It's like, it's like a herd that's running towards a cliff. And I guess it's, it's that, that old example of the lemmings. And we just don't have the consciousness to do it. If you're an individual and you're running towards a cliff, you'd go, I'm going to stop running towards a cliff. Like that's an easy conscious kind of thing to do. But as a, as a herd, we just seem to be unable to do it. And it's because we have no idea about mass psychology. We have no idea about how to contain ourselves and how to, to work as, as a collective, except unconsciously. Like we, we, we used to be able to work as individuals completely unconsciously or living in that, in that conscious thing to see, think of consciousness as, as a, as a completely distinguished thing. We just, we just acted out unconsciously. And so, it's, it's the thing of like, that's what, still what we're doing collectively. And I've been wondering, is it possible for us to become conscious as a, as a collectivity? And, and maybe that's, that's what this study of Q trees is really fascinating for me for. Cause it's, it's the think of like, well, this, this idea of the realm of the gods or of looking at these power relations or looking at the underlying structures is like, is there, is there something here we can work with? Is there something here where we can actually start to understand and become conscious of ourselves as a collective? When you look at the work of Foucault and, and, and the, the other postmodernists and they're, they're trying to create some consciousness around all of this and they're trying to create a consciousness of, of what's going on at, at, at a collective level that's, that's not just individuals maneuvering things, but is, is kind of the abstract thing of like power relations or of the simulation as, as Baudrillard would talk about it. And, and yet you fast forward a few decades and it's not really brought a level of collective consciousness. We're just seeing a, a similar thing of from a few centuries ago, we're just seeing unconscious patterns of the collectivity moving in a sort of a witch trials kind of thing, whether that's coming through the social justice movement, trying to change racial and, and sexist biases, but really just kind of falling into a, a sort of a, a witch trial cancel culture. And then on the other hand, you've got the, the same old conspiratorial thinking, which, which wants to impute the, the happenings in the world to a few individuals. And I think, I think there's a mistake made in the psychology there that really is, it's kind of thinking of 
what's going on at the collective level as being just a bigger level of like there's there's you and there's your schoolyard bully and then it's it's this is what's going on on a bigger stage you've got the elites and you've got the the small people and the elites are bullying the small people around but when you look at the the collective it's it's not just the the playing out of the same dynamic but bigger atom like molecules aren't just atoms but bigger life isn't just molecules but bigger there's there's something new that occurs at every new level at every new development and so when you move from the individual humans into the into the collective sphere, fear of humans it's like it's like if you study a beehive it's you've got the queen but just because you just because the queen is the, is the central and kind of the center of the power structure it doesn't mean that the the queen is the one that's that's puppeteering everything it's just that the queen has one role within this greater extended mind in 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 space so you can't really understand the beehive unless you look at it collectively as a, as a thing of interrelations. You can't just go to the Queen and be like, this is, this is how we understand the entire of the bee society. And that's kind of what the conspiratorial mindset wants to do, is it wants to project agency in the same way that the religious instinct before projected all the agency, all the natural forces that projected gods onto them. But it just doesn't seem to take into account that there, there's something greater going on. We're caught in a, in a system that's moving itself inexorably in a certain direction. And I think that this is where Jung's idea of the collective unconscious and the archetypes comes in and that we're being steered by impersonal forces, by forces that are greater than us, the forces that are, that are different to us. And this is, I really want to study Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene and, and get into his idea of the meme and the, this thing of ideas that are replicating themselves, ideas that are, are using humans to spread themselves. And it's, it's a simple model, but it comes at the, the same thing that Jung is coming at from a completely different angle. And I think it's a really important angle to come at it from, to try and put this together and to see how, how, how there's something moving through the, the mental sphere of humans that is, that is completely different to us, that is almost alien to us. And Dawkins puts the word meme on it and, and Jung might put the word God on it. But I, I think it's trying to get to that rather than seeing that it's like the Bilderberg group or some shape-shifting reptiles of the royal family or something. That It's not just humans, it's that there's something... There's something moving through humanity. There's something moving through the, the the mental sphere, and I think it's trying to get a grasp on that is something that really fascinates me. And I think that that's something that we're going to be exploring with Q3. And I, I don't know if how much there is to study with that. I don't know if there's anything we can do with the channel on that, since it's 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 something so intangible, and it's it's something that I think we're only at the very beginning of trying to become conscious of. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the real thing, strangely enough, like, from studying this four quadrant model. That's, that's the thing that's really jumped out at me. That's the thing that's really, um, that's got me thinking a lot is, is, is just a lot about how this collective consciousness idea, this, this idea of like, well, what, what are we doing in Q3? Cause it seems that all the work here has been done so recently. Whereas Q1, you can go all the way back to any of the ancient religious texts and maybe, you could you could say that Jung and the, and the mythology thing, and maybe there was a certain level of work being done in Q3 that we've just completely neglected, and that's that's an interesting hypothesis. The trouble with studying all these things is that they're so intangible, and Nietzsche got quite a lot of criticism for his his uh, his thesis of the Dionysian and the Apollonian, and the other philologists were just like, well, stay away from that guy's lectures. That guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about, and it's because. This Q3 stuff is so, it's so hard to grasp, like to try and nail down when modernity was, when traditionalism was, when post-modernity was. It's very, very difficult because, and I don't know whether that's, that's to do with the fact that we're, we're pretty unconscious of this level. And I've also had the thought that maybe we don't have the cognitive complexity. Maybe humanity itself doesn't have the cognitive complexity to pick out this, this massive trend of relations. Like we've, we've done really well with science to, focus on just like individual elements that that q2 type of science that's just like let's isolate one variable and work with that and we've made such great inroads with that and we've developed a, a fantastic theory of the world with it but you look at q4 with with things like chaos theory and trying to like map out this this massive structure of the world and uh, the interrelations of things the same with ecology of let's look at the relations between things but then you're not isolating single variables and this is why ecology, chaos theory, and even nutrition, that's why it's so hard to carry out these fields because there's so many variables that you have to keep a, keep a grasp on at any one point. And I've been wondering whether, yeah, 
do do humans have the the complexity to do that? Do we have the cognitive complexity to do that? Or that's something like AI could which can do just an almost infinite number of of computations that we can't and can hold all these bits of information in place. Would they be able to do this more relational science? Would they be able to do this more relational investigation into culture? It's a um, an interesting question for another day, but uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's just about everything that I wanted to. I really just went on a rant there about Q-Tree, but yeah, uh, it's kind of everything that I, I wanted to cover with uh, this, this episode and just why, what my personal take on, on this episode was and why I find it to be so important. Um, so so yeah, I guess this is just this is this is the quadrant that I'm really excited to to dig down into and study in Foucault and moving through continental philosophy. I'm really excited to see the insights there, and I, I want to go back to analytic philosophy, in particular Wittgenstein, his philosophical investigations, and try to understand because they came at it from a, another angle, looking at it from the the angle of of language. So I'm I'm really curious to to try and layer that in and and really just try and. And do like a deep study on on this corner of of knowledge and trying to understand us as at, at a collective level of consciousness. So that's 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 something that that fascinates me. And I'm also want to want to look at Heidegger, who maybe might might make this model somewhat irrelevant by trying to collapse. I know from what I've read of Heidegger, trying to collapse the duality between the internal and the external, the 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 mind body problem that that Descartes came up with, and whether that's actually just a false dichotomy. So also be exploring that with Heidegger. But uh, yeah, that's that's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. I'd like to to thank Shane and the other patrons who are, yeah, just making all this happen. It's 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 amazing and uh, just really appreciate the, the support. And if you want to get involved, you want to help out on Patreon, you can get your name in the credits like, like these amazing people and you can um, get access to other episodes. I won't always be doing ep- these episodes on here, so... Yeah, you might want to check in with that on Patreon. I'm thinking about putting an extra episode up a week, more like a one of the 100 days episodes on Patreon. So keep an eye out for those as well. And yeah, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I should see you next time. Thank you for watching.